Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our best-selling authors this evening, Alexandra Horowitz and Chris McDougall. Uh, Alexandra Horowitz is the author of the number one New York Times bestseller, Inside of a Dog, What Dogs See, Smell, and Know, and Being a Dog, Following the Dog into a World of Smell, among many others. Horowitz is a professor at Barnard College and Columbia University, where she teaches seminars in canine cognition, creative nonfiction writing, and audio storytelling. As senior research fellow, she heads the Dog Cognition Lab at Barnard, and she lives with her family and two large, highly sniffy dogs in New York City. I wish we could have brought them as well as the donkey. Uh, her new book, which we are here for this evening, is titled Our Dogs, Ourselves, The Story of a Singular Bond, which is a must read for every dog lover. Chris McDougall covered wars in Rwanda and Angola as a foreign correspondent for the Associated Press before writing his best-selling book, Born to Run, which has sold over three million copies worldwide, as well as Natural Born Heroes, Mastering the Lost Secrets of Strength and Endurance. His fascination with the limits of human potential led him to create the outside magazine web series, Art of the Hero. And he has also written for Esquire, the New York Times Magazine, Outside, Men's Journal, and the New York Times, and was a contributing editor for Men's Health. He currently lives with his wife and two daughters in Lancaster. His new book, of course, is titled Running with Sherman, the Donkey with the Heart of a Hero, which has received glowing reviews from Time Magazine, The New York Times, People Magazine, and elsewhere. A huge thank you to Chris and Alexander for making the trek to Harrisburg and, of course, for bringing the star of the show, the donkey. Uh, so at this time, let's welcome them to the stage and give them a huge round of applause. Great. So the only reason why Matilda was here today was because of Alex. He and I had a very terse, intense conversation on the phone a couple of days ago where I was like, you know, Alex, come on, man. It's, it's a pain in the ass to bring a donkey to Harrisburg. Who's going to care? It's just a donkey. It's going to be a donkey. And Alex was like, you got to bring the donkey. The second reason why, he totally talked to me. The second reason why was today, this morning, we were trying to load Sherman in the van. And if you have an opportunity to read Running with Sherman, you will understand why Matilda was the one here <laughs> and not Sherman. Sherman was just like, dude, I'm not doing it. I'm a donkey. There's no way you're going to force me to do anything. So then Matilda, like the little sister, is always like, well, if the big brother's too much of a sissy, then little sister will step right up. So Matilda hopped right in the van. So those of you who had a picture, make sure you caption a picture. It is you with Matilda, not with fake Sherman. Um, so one last thing I want to get to before we get down to business is that uh, any of you who have bought a copy, anyone here who has a copy of Running With Sherman you bought right now, would you look in the back of your book, in the back flap of the book, if you sort of peel it back, look inside that back flap and see whether you see like, one of those little tattoos. Is there a little tattoo? Anybody got a book with a tattoo in the back? Nobody's got one? Now, this person right here has one. What's your name? Perry. Perry? Perry, would you stand up for one second and show the crowd what's going on here? So this book right here with Perry has with a tattoo in the back, Perry is now entitled to a little prize, which means that Perry is a winner, and the rest of you are a big bunch of... But you don't have to remain one of those things. Another winner right there. This is like Willy Wonka in the chocolate. Another one right there, okay? I'll tell you right now, there's 21 of these things out there. I'm only seeing about four or five hands go up. So, but here's the deal is, remember Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? Charlie bought like five of those candy bars, right? <laughs> so here's what you get. If you do win, you get good stuff. You get stuff like, does anyone know the name of my first book? Confident, but incorrect. <laughs> I actually wrote a book called Girl Trouble, which is a true story of a sexy Mexican pop star and her brainwashing sex cult. True story, which is why I refer to my first book as Born to Run. So I've got copies of Girl Trouble. Alex, where, where's Alex? Where, where's Alex? Okay, do you guys carry Girl Trouble here in Midtown Scholar? That is a sign of a quality bookstore. The only copies of Girl Trouble which exist are in my hand and in my basement. So if you guys win, Perry, you may have won this prize. We will give you a plain brown envelope to bring home in. I've also got a very, very super limited supply of Sherman Pop Sockets. You guys know what pop sockets are? Okay, I just felt like the age of the crowd just distinguished right between like 25 and over 25. 
So pop sockets are, these are designed after Sherman's own hoof. And you put it on the back of your cell phone and let you sort of pop it out and take selfies. Did you win a prize? And you're dying for this thing, aren't you? All right, here you go. <laughs> she drove all the way from Atlanta for this, so. And the last thing I've got as a possible prize, and now don't start fighting over this. All right, it is a photograph, and I only got one of them. I'm afraid to show you. It is a picture of Sherman and his little friend Polly the cat. The biggest collective odd in history. Anyway, so if you guys have not bought a copy of Running with Sherman or. Okay, well, you got a prize already. What are you complaining about? Okay. Either Running with Sherman or Our Dogs Ourselves. There are 20, there are 10 in each and a bonus one in there. So if you guys haven't gotten a book yet, don't be polite. Just get up, step on people's toes fight your way over to the counter and just buy another book and just keep buying until, <laughs> or remain a loser for the rest of your lives. Okay, so that's what's going on. So thank you so much to Midtown Scholar for having us in. And thank you so much for Dr. Horowitz because the reason why I asked her to come, and I sort of can't believe she said yes, is because I was in an event in Phoenixville at the Capitol Theater where they screened the film Isle of Dogs. And then Dr. Horowitz got up afterwards and like off the cuff was just so electrifying. I was like, oh my God, like this is how you give an author talk. And I was like taking mental notes, like be like her. And I thought, I don't have to be like her. I can just ask her to come and do it. So, <laughs> so here's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna try this kind of format where we each speak for like five minutes and then kind of riff off of each other. I have no idea if it's gonna work. Uh, and I'm already over five minutes. So I'm gonna cut it real quick. Um, the reason I got involved in this project in the first place was I was born and grew up around Philadelphia, mostly in Upper Darby. I'm not an animal guy at all, never had pets growing up. And so as a kind of a, a total like whim, my wife and I were living in downtown Philly, 23rd and Fairmount, and we got this idea of like, let's just like pole vault out of here out of Philly, which is kind of like a rough and tumble place to raise a kid, let's just see if we can get completely into a different atmosphere altogether. And we kind of succeeded. We went from Philadelphia to Peach Bottom. <laughs> Do you guys know Peach Bottom at all? Yeah. All right, so you know what I'm talking about, right? Southern End Pride, right? It's, uh, it, it's kind of pokey down there. I, remember, I was actually doing an interview once on the phone. I realized I have not seen a car all day, and it's 7.30 p.m. So we went from downtown Philly, and if you have Running with Sherman, unfortunately you have the G version, because the previous version had 29 profanities in it, and I know they're 29 because a bookseller in the Midwest called my editor and asked if he could remove the 29 profanities from the book, which made me want to add about 25 more, right? <laughs> but the one I took out really to me described what Philly's like. So uh, you guys have all run marathons, right? A lot of you have run marathons. So you know, like in races, they always hold those signs up. They go like, you're almost done, you know, way to go. In Philly, there's a guy at the finish line who has this big cardboard sign that goes, run you <laughs> fire truck. That was the hardest one to take out of the book. So I actually scrubbed the 29 profanities out of the book. That was the last one. It was the hardest one to take out. So, because to me, like, that's what Philly's like. So we move from Philly, we arrive in Peach Bottom, and we just start to kind of get used to life in a really different atmosphere, a place where, you know, horse and buggies come by the front of your house, uh, where your neighbors show up with like free strawberries and free zucchinis when they're, when they're in season. Um, you know, a much quieter, more sharing, more humane place. I'd never been around the Amish before. This was a whole new experience. But the real watershed moment in our lives was when my nine-year-old daughter, I made the mistake of asking her what she wanted for her birthday, and she says, a donkey, a donkey. <laughs> now, I've only heard one answer worse than that in my life. I asked another nine-year-old in Seattle what she wanted for her birthday, and her answer was, a breeding age dolphin. <laughs> so at, at least my mammal was like land-based. <laughs> so yeah, I knew what she was thinking about. We had seen a woman riding a donkey in the woods one day. We're on the Conest you guys know the Conestoga Trail uh, over by Holwood? Okay, so we, we actually were on the trail, and some woman comes up riding a donkey on the trail, 
And we're like, wow, that's really kind of cool. You can ride donkeys. I never knew that before. And then we go home and all the normal people in the family just forgot about it. <laughs> but my daughter, Sophie, like for a year is like thinking, thinking, thinking. And so when I ask her what she wants for her birthday, what she's thinking is, you know what, man? Like no more school bus for me. <laughs> ride a donkey to school, which I kind of dug. So we ended up taking in a donkey. Um, we had a neighbor, when I asked him if he knew any donkeys around, he actually said, yeah, he knew one. It was in the possession of a hoarder. A guy had it locked in a stall, uh, and they were trying desperately to get this donkey away from the hoarder. When I went to look at it, it was actually in way worse shape than I expected. Um, it was kind of difficult to talk this guy into turning the donkey over to us, but we succeeded. And we got him home, and only when we got him out in the daylight and I got a look at this animal did I realize what kind of condition he was in. I mean, his hooves had grown out so long that he couldn't walk anymore. The hooves had grown out and up, kind of like, uh, like sled runners. Uh, he had this kind of look in his, in his eyes, just dead, vacant, dead fish eyes, had like manure and, and gunk stuck to his fur. I wasn't sure if he was actually gonna survive. Um, one thing about donkeys is, and horses, is they need to move to live. They can't digest. They can't move um, food through their digestive system unless they're churning their legs. And this animal couldn't walk at all. So um, luckily, that same woman I'd seen riding the donkey in the woods a year earlier, when we got this donkey and I realized what kind of desperate condition it was in, I knew I was going to need help. So I, I asked around the neighbors, like, hey, anybody know that, that, that woman with the saddle and the donkey. And apparently, in the southern end, if you're a woman riding around on a donkey in the woods, like, everyone knows who you are. <laughs> oh yeah, you want Tanya, here you go, here's your number. So I called Tanya up, and she rushed over, and she and her husband were able to do some kind of Hail Mary, desperate, last ditch, hoof surgery and nursing on this animal. They literally trimmed the donkey's hooves with a hacksaw to get it down to the point where it could move a little bit. And they treated it with antibiotics and pain relievers. And at one point in this process, Tanya, who's a very sweet woman most of the time, but if you ever get sideways with her with an animal, she will cut your effing throat. <laughs> and as she's treating this donkey and trying to cure it, at one point she clips off these like shears. I have not said a single F word so far. I just want you all to know. Okay, good, good. This is the... All right, man, this is a totally bleached out mouth for me today. So we'll see how long it lasts. Anyway, at one point, she, she turns off these shears, and she's waving them in my face. And she's like, now listen, you're not just going to stick them out in the field. You got that? If this animal survives, you got to give him a job. And I'm just, you know, with the shears in my face, I'm just agreeing to everything she says. So like, yeah, you got a job. But like, what effing job do I have for a donkey? Like, I'm not like a prospector. <laughs> It's like I'm like in the pioneer westward, you know? <laughs> so I'm agreeing to this, and I'm saying yes, 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 but the only job I can think about, possibly, is to make him my running partner. So this is where Dr. Horowitz comes into the story for the first time, because I actually wanted to run by somebody who was not threatening me with a sharp object. Like, <laughs> does an animal really need a job? You know, is this really a purpose? So I was able to actually track her down to the Capitol Theater and ask her that question. And maybe I'll just stop right here and let Alexandra tell you the rest from here. It's, this is not unlike... This is not unlike um, speaking after Isle of Dogs, actually. Because I, it's, that's a, at the Colonial Theater, they have this thing which is a science on screen where um, you, throw, you show a movie and then a scientist comes and kind of like explains the movie. It reminds me a little bit of um, the, something E.B. White said a long time ago, which is that uh, you know, explaining a joke, um, the last one I did was best in show, so explaining a joke is kind of like dissecting a frog. Like at the end, you have a underst better understanding, but you have a dead frog. <laughs> And I thought the thing you don't want to do after this big spectacle is to kind of like unpack it all and and try to like say, well, this is what it all means. You know, they put on the science hat and some and but and somehow when the lights go down, you're supposed to stand up and be like, say something equally good. Right. And it's kind of like that following you standing here. <laughs> So thanks a lot. A lot. <laughs> um, so I come to this because, well, I'm a dog cognition researcher. I'll tell you a little bit about what that phrase means in a second. But this book is about the dog-human bond and really about the animal-human bond and 
Chris asked me to come to this and he sent me his book and his book is also about the animal human bond. Oh, I guess it's about running and right. And it's about a donkey and it's about a boy and it's about, it's about living in peach bottom, right. At some level, but, um, it's also about the things you'll do for your animals and the things that the animals can bring out in you. And I find that fascinating. And although I study dogs, it's, the dog human bond that has recently been the subject of my gaze. Um, when I study dogs, I do it in a lab. What does that mean? There's a room at Barnard in New York city where, um, I ask owners and dogs to come and I give the dogs little puzzles and, um, I show them things and I just see what they do. That's all. It's a very fun game basically that they play. Um, and then I try to make inferences about what the dogs know or understand based on that behavior. So when I bring in owners and you know, owners are the ones who were recruiting this, their dogs for this. It's not like the dogs are ever saying, I want to come to the dog cognition lab. So it's owners who are like, I want my dog to come mostly because they want to see how smart their dog is. <laughs> So right up front, we always just say like, your dog looks super smart. <laughs> Except for there's like 1% of people who want to see how dumb their dog is. They're like, my, <laughs> so we always say their dog is smart, their, is smart too. But when they come in the room, something interesting happens. I'm just looking at the dog behavior, the quadrupeds behavior, but instantly there's all sorts of stuff going on between the two of them that I have to try to like, quiet you know as soon as the dog comes in with the person the person is talking to the dog they're saying here we are here we are finnegan i don't know what we're gonna do yeah look around i'm gonna have a seat you know, they're just talking so that's interesting and then the dog is looking to the person there's the do the person is going to tell them what's going to happen you know where what where should i sit are you sitting uh, maybe i'll sit should i explore what am i going to do with these things they put on the floor and so we always have to make sure the human does nothing we blind the human to the purpose of our experiment. So we sometimes have them turn their back or put on sunglasses and we distract them. We give them irrelevant tasks to do while the dog is doing their thing. Like just count like the number of tail wags they do. And so you have the person sitting there and we finish the trial and at the end they're like 12 and we're like, oh yeah, that's great, 12, thank you. But it means that they're not cueing their dog as to how to answer the puzzle that we've, you know, f given them. Anyway, so I, all my books, Inside of a Dog, Being a Dog, are about looking at the dog. I want to know what it's like to be a dog, understand their perception, their mind. But then I also got interested at in looking at that talking person in the room and how we got to the place that people are bringing in their dogs to things like dog cognition labs, you know, wearing raincoats or in like fancy purses um, and talking to them. And so that's how I come here. And so now I think what's going to happen is that um, we're going to tell Chris's idea is we tell some stories. Chris will go first. And then I'm going to kind of riff off of what he says. So we'll see how that goes. Chris, you're up. Cool. So um, let's see. OK, so I mentioned I was going to try and turn Sherman into my running partner. This was not an original idea. This idea had actually been come up with about 150 years earlier. Uh, back in Colorado, back during the mining days, there was this tradition where prospectors up in the mountains would strike gold and they would chuck all their gear on the back of a donkey and then run to the nearest town as fast as possible to register the claim. So this became kind of a, a ritual there. So you had these prospectors who were in these wild west towns in the Rockies in the 1800s. Now they got gold in their pockets. They got donkeys outside. They got time on their hands. So what do they do? They start to bet each other. I bet you I can run the fair play faster than you. I'll bet you $1,000. You're on. So these guys would go outside with their donkeys and then run 27 miles from Leadville, Colorado, up and over Mosquito Pass to fair play. This went on from the 1800s up until in 1951, pack barrel racing actually became Colorado's official summer sport. Yes, the, the state that brought you legalized marijuana <laughs> also brought you pack burrow racing as an official sport. So here's where the story gets kind of intriguing. Does anyone know what the oldest marathon in America is? This is a curiously uneducated crowd. I'm sorry? Boston. Repeat that. Boston. 
Well, thank you, early reader of Running With Sherman. <laughs> Someone's done his homework. <laughs> So yes, uh, most people would say Boston, those who have not bought early copies of Running With Sherman. Yeah, so Boston, the Boston Marathon's been around since the uh, 1890s, like 1897, and it's been run every year since. It claims to be the oldest marathon in America, except it's only the oldest marathon in America if you happen to come pre-equipped with a penis. If you are not a dude, you are not allowed to run Boston until the 1970s for very good reason, because as we know, Women would faint, they would lose their uteruses. <laughs> this was the official medical opinion of like the US Medical Association. And so as women, most of you know that whenever you want to do something, it's always better to ask a guy if it's a good idea. And then the men can tell you whether you may hurt yourself. So until the 1970s, dudes, like literally like 70 year old guys with cigars were telling like these young fit women, no, nah, you can't do it, sweetheart, you're gonna hurt yourself. <laughs> Except in Colorado, they didn't seem to care that much about women. So when they did the first official pack race in 1951, and the women said, how come we can't run? And the guys are like, if you want to run 27 miles over a mountain at 12,000 feet with a 1,000 pound donkey, like be my guest. <laughs> so here's what I found intriguing about pack racing is that it's been around since the 1950s. And if you go back through the finishing times, what you find is a very curious phenomenon that it is almost a coin toss one year to the next if the winner is male or female, old or young. So you look at most male-dominated events, the, the events created by dudes, for dudes, for other dudes to watch on Sunday from their sofas. You know, football, baseball, basketball, these were sports that guys created which take advantage of uniquely male characteristics, basically testosterone in bulk. That's what makes you a good football player, baseball player, testosterone in bulk. Now you get into an activity that doesn't rely on those uniquely male characteristics, that relies on adaptability, endurance, and cooperation. And suddenly you see the differences between men and women, old and young, start to diminish. What happens now is you have a 52-year-old woman named Barb Dolan that can go into a pack borough race against a 24-year-old sub three hour marathoner and kick the living crap out of them. Uh, not long ago, the two best ultra marathoners in the world, Max King and Ryan Sands, these guys are in their 20s. They have dominated races of 100, 150 miles, 50 miles, destroy the competition. They come to Colorado. They are given two of the fastest, best trained racing burrows alive. They're put in the, in the care of a woman named Meredith Hodges, the best equine trainer in the, in the country. They train for two weeks, they enter the World Championship Pack Bar Race, and they get their asses kicked. 14-year-old <laughs> girl beat Max King by an hour. <laughs> an hour. So, which leaves me wondering, now what is going on in pack borough racing, this animal-human partnership that to me, um, cure, the results basically, basically speak for themselves. For some reason, when you put animals and humans into a contest, suddenly it's not about authority, power, dominance, noise. Something else is going on that's both physical and mental and communicative. And that's where I'll stop right there. Okay. That's a hard one to follow, because I could talk about Colorado, or I could talk about dogs at 14,000 feet. Um, I think I'm going to talk about the male female part of that. Actually, I think I know why, right? The women are better at this, besides the endurance element, is that they're thinking about the donkeys. Um, and that matters, and that also matters in any dyadic relationship with a person and an animal, you're going to do better if you're thinking about what that animal's experience is, what they are thinking, right? And so, and women are, as we know, classically more empathetic than men. Well, no. Okay. On average, on average, but I think that's something about that is going on is if I were handed a donkey to run with, like I'm thinking not about this donkey is going to pull me to the finish or how can I pull this thing along, but like, what's going on for this donkey, right? Like, how can we do this together? Um, so, but something, men and women, men and women, one thing that occurs to me is we have slightly different ways. Oh, if I focus on that talking to dogs, the people who come to my lab with their dogs, they're talking. 
Um, and I loved that they were talking. I got pretty interested in that they were talking, and I started writing down what they said. And I did a study of dog-human play, and I and I um, trans where I asked people to send in videos of themselves playing with their dogs, and I transcribed everything that the people were saying. We asked them to just play with their dog. We were interested in types of play that they did with their dogs, but they're all talking to their dogs. They're pulling on a treat and then th and uh, or on a toy and then throwing it and saying to the dog, "Kill it! Kill it! Kill it! Kill it! Kill it! Kill it!" Like this, and I'm like, "Oh God!" So I wrote all that down, and I got pretty interested in this and then I realized I'm in Manhattan I walk out my door and like 30 seconds later there's a person and a dog and you know what happens when you start walking toward people with their dogs sometimes they start talking to their dog as if to say like I'm not in I'm not walking by myself <laughs> we're together and so I started doing what in scientific parlance I call um, eavesdropping <laughs> on people and writing down everything that people said um, and now I have, a, you know, a thousand plus utterances that people said to their dogs and got context and whether it was a male or female. And here's where the male female thing comes in because we speak a little bit differently to our dog. Women speak about in my notebook scribblings and in scientific studies of, of dog talkers. And there are such things about six times as much. Um, to dogs as men do. We speak more, we use more repetitions, that kill it, kill it, kill it, that was a woman. We, we, use, uh, we use a high-pitched baby talk, and that's men and women who use baby talk, and I think it may be more comfortable for women, and we're not shy about dropping in like a term of endearment. There are a lot of sweetie pies, cutie pie, poopy face, whatever it is. It's more likely to be a woman and a man. And so I found that fascinating, but the whole phenomenon of talking to dogs really intrigued me. There's a special kind of language we use with dogs. It seems at first like it could be baby talk, because it's like baby talk in a lot of ways. It is that high-pitched register. We're kind of talking to them like they don't really understand, right? But maybe with a baby, we're trying to teach them language. And we're not trying to teach a dog language. So what is it that we're saying? I came up with a couple of categories of things that we say to our dogs. One is basically based on it being so many women who are talking to the dogs. It's called the mom commentary on behavior, which as a mom, I think I get to say this like, Eyes on the dog, I see everything. And I have to say something about it, right? So I, people, a woman walking out with her dog, she had four, I remember very clearly, she had four dogs and they were all in sweaters. And one of them lifts their leg to pee and she's like, you're going first, excelente, awesome job. It's mom commentary. Men are not immune from this kind of commentary. Um, I r recorded a guy who was uh, talking to the dog, who was looking at him forlornly. He said, uh, somebody has a bagel, and it's not you. <laughs> it's not going to be you with that kind of behavior. <laughs> So that's one kind of thing. There's another type of like um, sort of forever unanswered questions that we say to our dogs. This is the kind of like, I don't see what's so interesting. It's a lamppost. What's so interesting about the lamppost? Said to the dog as they're spending a little time <laughs> sniffing. Um, there's a whole bunch of categories. And what I decided eventually is that what these ways of talking to dogs represent is the, that we're really talking to ourselves. Um, there's a language, a narrative we have going on in our head all the time. You know, here we are. I'm going to sit here. What are we doing now? And it's a monologue, but they're kind of more than one voice. We might ask ourselves questions and answer them in our heads. And I think what we're doing is actually letting the dog in on that intimate conversation between ourselves and ourselves. Like how much more intimate can it be but letting them in on this conversation nobody else hears? Um, we even pause to let them respond, right? You know, there was one guy who said, um, to a dog, and this was a kind of implausible instruction that I heard from a lot of people. Um, his dog was being sniffed and he said, come on, be a man. <laughs> Aren't you a man? <laughs> the dog says nothing. <laughs> All right, back to you, Chris. <laughs> that should be the title of a book, The Dog Says Nothing. <laughs> um, so this is something I learned from your books, and maybe 
not to, to sort of cue this this pitch up to you too, you know, broadly, but um, what what you discovered from researching the uh, drug sniffing dogs at University of Pennsylvania. So when we had this this donkey, and I had this idea of getting involved in the pack borough races. And I got this woman waving these shears in my face, telling me, you better give it a job. You have to give it a job. I'm like, all right, all right, all right. Uh, and the job I thought was, okay, I know myself, if it's something that I get bored at doing and I kind of don't want to do it, at some point I'm just going to quit. I'm just not going to do it. So if the job that I had for this donkey was like walking in a circle in the corral every day, I swear I'm going to do it, but after two weeks I'm just going to quit. I'm just not going to bother. It's going to have to be something I like to do, which is why I thought, you know what, I like to run. If I can get this animal to run, that can give it the movement it needs to survive. So maybe this race could be the answer, you know, because when you train for a race every day, you got to get out there. You got to find a religion, you know, you got to get out there and put your miles in every day. You got to extend your miles. You got to find new routes to do. It'll be fun for me. It'll be fun for him. So I actually floated this idea by Tanya, the woman who's helping me. And I kind of cringed at what she was going to say. You know, I mean, here is this lame animal. And I'm talking about running 29 miles at 12,000 feet. And she actually kind of chewed it over. And she's like, you know, that's not exactly the stupidest thing you could have said. <laughs> it's like it's like top three. By the way, guys, is, is this a microphone carrying up there? Can you guys hear me OK? OK, cool. It's like top three, but not it's not grand champion stupid. She's like, uh, it's kind of interesting. You know, it's going to be interesting and entertaining and novel for him. But the question is, can he even walk? Can he even actually support himself on a hard surface? And she goes, we got to find out today because we're now in life or death zone. If it's not walking, it's not eating, it's not going to survive. So today's the day. Let's, let's test this out. So she goes, now there are two things you got to understand about donkeys. If you're going to train a donkey... You're dealing with an animal that by instinct is really suspicious and skeptical and wants to think for himself. So the two things you have to understand is this. Number one, and this applies to dudes as well. Anything you want a donkey to do, you got to make him think it was his idea first. <laughs> and number two also applies to dudes. Anything you start with a donkey, you got to finish. You can't give up in the middle because if you do, it tells them, you see that? I was right. I was right in the first place. It was a bad idea. And now I'm going to double down and never do it. So Tanya goes, we're going to try it with this donkey right now. So first of all, let's make him think it was his idea. So uh, she goes, there was a goat we had named Lawrence. And Sherman kind of had his eye on Lawrence, kind of follow him around a little bit. So she goes, go get that goat he likes. Bring him out to the road. So she puts a rope on Sherman's halter and... I get the goat and I lead the goat past Sherman to the edge of the, uh, the meadow and out into the road. And Sherman watches this goat go by and then it starts to work. She, he starts to follow, like trudge along behind the goat. And the further the goat goes, the further Lawrence goes until the goat, I'm sorry, Sherman goes, until the goat went off the grass and into the road. And at that point, Sherman stops and he goes, you know what? I like the goat. I, I don't love the goat. <laughs> this is as far as I'm going. And even though we had the goat out in the road, Sherman's like, F no, I ain't doing it. This is it. And so Tanya's like, I don't know if he's afraid of the asphalt or if physically he may never be able to step on a hard surface. So we've tried number one. We made him think it was his idea. Now number two, anything you start, you got to finish. So this woman takes this rope and she walks about 12 feet out into the road and she sits down on the rope and puts it behind her butt like she's like fishing for like great white sharks. <laughs> And she leans back on this rope and pulls it taut. And Sherman's looking at her and going, dude, I'm a donkey. Like, this is what we do. You're not pulling me anywhere. So he locks down like donkey style. And she goes back full strength, full weight. And I'm watching this tug of war between the most stubborn creature on earth and Sherman. <laughs> and neither one of them is giving up. This is 40 minutes she's pulling on this rope before Sherman finally stands up and steps on, on the ground. And Tanya goes, we did it. That was his job. He did his job. He can step on, on the hard surface. Now let's let him go. Now that afternoon was something kind of intriguing because I thought this was a huge triumph that Sherman actually stepped on the pavement. Like she did it 40 minutes, but she did it. So when my daughters came home from school that day, I wanted to show off the same thing. So I get the goat and hey, we can bring Lawrence down and we got the donkey and we come down. And then now I, I start to sit back on the rope to pull it and Sherman just keeps on going. He just walks in the road. <laughs> and I'm like, what the hell? And off he goes. 
But then all of a sudden he stops, and I can't get him to move. And then he starts again and stops. I can't figure out what's going on until it finally clicked in my head. What was happening was, once Lawrence the goat was out of the way, my older daughter, Maya, kept on walking, and Sherman just clicked from Lawrence over to her and just started following her. But then when she wanted her turn to walk with the, the donkey, she came back, and now there's nobody in front of him anymore, and he stops. But then when my daughter Sophie walked out in front, she started to follow again. So what I realized what had happened was it wasn't just so much that that morning he had learned to put his weight on the hard surface. It's that somehow he had figured out that there's a game going on. There's a game of follow the leader. And as long as there's a leader, he's going. And if there's no leader, he's stopping. So what, what happened was it, it didn't dawn on me that I knew there's a race. Tanya knew there's a race. But no one had told Sherman that we're training for a race. <laughs> He doesn't know what the game is. And so he had to invent a game for himself. But once he did, suddenly we had a breakthrough. And that became so important to me to figure out is make them understand there's a game. Great. OK, there's a lot of stuff in there. So what the things I was thinking of um, were donkey, dude. Did you ever read that piece, uh, How Sh Shamu Saved My Marriage? You know, and she, this was a woman who learned to do positive reinforcement training with um, marine mammals. And then she used that same positive, positive reinforcement training on her husband. <laughs> same principles apply, basically. Just reward them when they, you do the, the thing, they do the thing that you want them to. And don't ever punish. Don't talk about it. Just wait till they do the thing and be like, that's great, sweetie. <laughs> Right, but there is a lot of parallel between training um, ourselves and training non-human animals. It's sort of getting them to believe it's their thing, rewarding them for that, and then you're both on your way. So there could be that. There could be umwelt. So one of the things that I think Chris did, which was maybe intuitively, and Tanya definitely had the intuition about, was understanding what is going on with Sherman. And I'm very interested in this for in thinking about dogs. What's the perceptual world of Sherman such that he doesn't want to go on to asphalt? say, right? And that's what I'm interested in all the time. What is it like to be a dog? They're not like us. They live with us. They're in an anthropogenic environment, but they're smelling creatures. What happens when you wash your dog in coconut lavender shampoo? Is the first thing they do sit and admire themselves in the mirror or sit on the couch and feel good? No. What do they do? They go roll and roll and try to get off, right? So like their behavior makes so much more sense when you start thinking about their world. They are full of interest in smells. So that's another way I could go with this. But I think the way I want to go for the whatever, now three minutes I have left, is um, the I job. Five <laughs> I'm staying. I'm very good rule follower. I'm going to stay with five <laughs> minutes, Chris. Um, so is the job that you might need to give an animal. I think what's interesting with the companion animals we have now with dogs is that most of them don't have a job. I mean, our, their job is to be companions to us. But the weird thing about that job is that we leave them alone for most of their lives. So they must feel like they're doing a really bad job <laughs> all the time. And so what works against this sometimes is if you do give them something to do, right? And what the, the best example of this are animals who are not primarily pet dogs, but they're working dogs. Um, and when I got very interested in what the olfactory world of a dog was like, I followed some um, drug training dogs, drug tracking dogs in training. I went and watched truffle detection dogs in the Northwest. Um, and I followed, um, I talked to a guy who does um, scat detection dog work, which is like gotta be the dog's dream job. <laughs> Like finding poop. <laughs> they just like, they apply for that position. Like, like I really, I found a lot of poop today. I'm really good at finding poop. My parents have said that. So these dogs, and this is, so this is a great job. Um, this dog, there's a dog named Tucker who is in Puget Sound and, and Sam Wasser and his group Conservation Canines are wildlife biologists and they need to track and kind of make sense of large populations of animals who, who know when humans are approaching and who don't want to be approached by humans. So how do you canvas how many, you know, grizzly bears are in an area and so forth? You send the dogs after their poop, you, take um, little samples of it, and you find out how many individuals there are. Same with orcas. This dog, Tucker, would go on the, out on the boat with them, and he could smell orca poop a nautical mile away. 
What happens when orcas poop, which you probably don't know, is that the poop floats to the surface, stays up there for a couple minutes, and then it sinks. So he was detecting it in those couple of minutes that it was on the surface, and he would lead the researchers. He would point in the direction, in the front of the boat, that they should go if they want to get a little bit of survey of that um, poop and see what orcas are out there. So what a fantastic job for dogs to have. Your dog might be doing a job that they just haven't told you about. <laughs> If they're finding the poop, the deer poop, right? All so anyway, it's just something to think about living with dogs is what's the job that we're giving them so that they're mentally stimulated so that they, you know, get up in the morning and like, what are we doing today? You know, um, instead of I'm going to bark at everybody who goes by outside the window because that's maybe the job they figured out to do, you know, give them something else to do. Alex, what do you think? Okay. Um, should sure. we go into Caesar Melange? Is that too big? Whatever you want. Okay. Whatever you want. So, um, again, I came into this whole process completely green, uh, un incompetent, knowing nothing about how to train animals, didn't know anything at all about uh, orca poop sniffing dogs at all. <laughs> and one of the people I went to for help was a guy who's actually become kind of controversial in the dog world, which is Caesar Milan. Uh, Do you guys ever watch the show The Dog Whisperer? Okay. So, a friend of mine named Louis Escobar lives out in Santa Barbara. If you guys have Born to Run, Louis is the guy that took the cover photo and all the photos for that, that whole operation. Louis did something he was kind of proud of. He coaches a high school cross country team in Santa Barbara, and he's also friends with a woman who runs a dog shelter, a rescue shelter. And so in August, it was really hot. The kids didn't want to run. So Lewis got the idea of like, hey, I'll take all my kids out to the shelter and we'll get a bunch of the dogs. And we'll take the dogs out for a run. So Lewis is a photographer. So he set things up where he was videotaping the whole thing. So he takes a videotape of his high school kids running with these shelter dogs. And in about five minutes, it got like 12 million views. I'm not exaggerating. It was like 12 million views like in a week. And the reason why, though, is because you see all these kids running by with the dogs. At the very end, there's this very handsome kid named like Jose. And he's carrying this like beautiful little dog in his arms. And you hear Lewis's voice off camera saying, hey, Jose, what's going on? And he goes, well, Cuddles is tired. We're just going to walk. <laughs> and you see him walking toward the camera. And then the little caption at the bottom was, that afternoon, Jose went back to his, with his mother and they adopted Cuddles. 12 million views. <laughs> but there's also a lot of pushback. There were a lot of people on Facebook who were firing messages off to Lewis saying, are you out of your effing mind, dude? You are running with rescue pit bulls. You got 16 year olds running around with a pit bull on a leash. Someone's gonna get killed. Like someone's gonna get seriously hurt. And so I was talking about this with Lewis and I said, hey, why don't we try and like, connect you with the person I thought was like the most famous dog trainer in the world, Cesar Milan. And Cesar Milan actually agreed to meet up with uh, me and Lewis and discuss whether this was a good idea or a bad idea. Uh, it was a wonderful afternoon. Cesar Milan was extraordinarily gracious. Um, what I, I was intrigued by was when we got there, as soon as we got out of the car and we walked toward uh, the home where we we're going to see him, he comes out of the house and he just starts lecturing Lewis almost immediately. But minute by minute in the videotape, he's like, oh, coach, I'm so glad you're here. Coach, listen, about a minute 120, remember that little brown dog? You see how the kid was holding the leash? And Lewis like, I just shot the thing. I didn't memorize it. <laughs> but he had broken down the film into like kid by kid, dog by dog, minute by minute, and was analyzing everything that was going wrong. And in the end, he says, no, coach, basically... You got a lot of crazy dogs and a lot of crazy kids. That, that's a lot of crazy. So, so you want to minimize the crazy. And he basically broke down ways where uh, my friend Lewis could possibly implement this running with dogs, uh, rescue dog strategy. But what I was intrigued by was, again, I'm a novice in this world. So I was impressed by the whole procedure. And only afterwards did I start to read up and realize there's a pretty good, um, uh, pretty vocal voices out there who really disagree with Cesar Milan's entire approach, his uh, leader of the pack approach. Uh, I found him to be an extraordinarily gracious guy and a guy who gave practical tips which could be worthwhile and useful. Um, but that's why I'm really intrigued to hear other viewpoints that think maybe, maybe this is not the guy to follow after all. All right, so that's a fun one. Um, <laughs> trainers. 
you know, tra good trainers are good observers. That's what they are. And they're also good at talking to people because they're training the people, not the dogs. They're training the people to also see the dogs. The thing I'll say that's controversial about um, Cesar Milan is that he, he uses punishment, first of all. And he also has this outdated mode of... Um, um, uh, a pack, this idea of the pack mentality that you have to kind of fit into the wolf pack and you have to be the alpha, right? And so th that works for him. That's what, that's what he does. Um, but I'm really sensitive to science being applied correctly. And so in that case, he just, has the, he just had the wrong science. So that idea, which is not just he, but many, many people believed, came from studies of adolescent wolves in the 70s. Um, and this was a time when you couldn't, there wasn't GPS you could put on wolves. You couldn't do Google Maps surveys of how many wolves there were in the wild. So to study wolf behavior, wolf ethologists, wolf biologists, would study captive wolves. And these were maybe wolves that had been um, caught in a trap and couldn't be put out back in the wild again and so they were just kept infinitely uh, indefinitely and there were adolescent male wolves that were being studied and somebody noticed that their behavior was very hierarchical right so when somebody put f meat in the pen there was always a wolf who got to eat first and he described their behavior as being a dominance hierarchy where there was an alpha who was going to eat first and the beta etc and that those who were beta were trying to struggle to be, overcome the alpha. So Cesar Milan and other people took that model and said, well, that's the way, that's just the way canids work, right? And so if we're going to interact with them, that's how we have to work too. As it turns out though, when we started studying wolf behavior in the wild, David Mech, many others, found out that that's not what the packs are like at all in normal families. That was a group of adolescent male wolves in a small space. Put a bunch of adolescent males of any species together in a small space, you're going to have a dominance hierarchy. But that doesn't mean that wolves naturally form a dominance hierarchy. They live in the wild in family packs. So just for a second, think about that. Family packs. Their parents, and then they're, they're young, and maybe their young's young. And the kids, they might give their parents trouble, but they're not trying to overthrow their parents, right? If your dog in your home did overthrow you, what happens? Then they're like, okay, what next? <laughs> right? Like, they're not trying to be the alpha, right? And, and so that analogy is possibly harmful because if you're trying to dominate your dog so they don't dominate you, you're going to do a lot of behaviors that are, that are inapt. On the other hand, I think, it is, so I think it is good to look at wolf behavior often to explain dog behavior. And I'm just going to give one quick example and then I'll cut off. Um, this is something that I wrote about in my first book, Inside of a Dog, when you come home and your dog licks your face. Right? If you let your dog lick your face, they will lick your face when, when you return home. And it's, and, and it's part of this exuberant greeting. And we describe it sometimes as kisses, right? Dog kisses. Um, I know, I will allow my dog to lick me and it seems really great and people love it. And I said, well, let's look at wolf behavior just to get like a, the ancestral idea of what this might be. So we have these family packs. What usually happens are some of the older wolves will go off and hunt while most of the pups stay around in the home territory. And if they are successful, they consume their, their food, they return to the pack, and all the other pups mob around the parents, um, licking at their face, right? It's a greeting, you're back, we're so glad you're back, but it's also a request for the wolves to regurgitate a little of the food that they've just <laughs> hunted and killed, and that's what they do. It stimulates them to regurgitate the food, they vomit it, the pups can eat it up. So, when your dog licks around your face, if you just spit up a little bit of that sandwich, it's totally okay. So I think we're gonna stop here. Yeah, and, um, that's a great note to stop on, all right. Any questions? There's, Alex has a mic, Yes. so if you want to raise your hand, he can find his way to you. Yep, raise your hand and I'll come around with a mic. Questions? Yes, in the back. We'll start over here. Oh, thank you. I wondered if you have a good argument for, is it on? 
Oh, thank you. I wonder if you have a good argument for people who insist that their dog does something out of spite. Oh, yeah, great. Uh, that's for me, I assume. Or should Chris try to answer that? Okay. Um, yeah, well, I think that's, I mean, that's one of the things that interested me most as a scientist when I started studying dogs was that as soon as we get a dog, we start to talk about what they're doing and what they know and what they understand using human descriptions of behavior, right? And one of those are all these attributions of emotions like, like um, spite, like revenge, like he's getting revenge on me. I left, I didn't take him out, I left him for eight hours and now he's got his revenge, <laughs> right? Um, and I try to unpack those things empirically. So I did a big study on the guilty look, for instance, say, you know, which dogs do, and we think they feel guilty for doing something wrong. Um, and in my study I showed actually they're responding to you looking angry or mad, even, even when it feels like you aren't looking angry or mad before they do the behavior. Um, they're really good at responding to us. And we don't know if they feel guilt or not, but that look isn't it. With spite, we would say there's just no, there's just no evidence, I would say, that this is an emotion the dog's feeling. It's fit. And I, I think the thing is, that doesn't mean they're not feeling spite. I mean, I think dogs could feel angry, but mostly constitutionally, they will return to us with glee and good humor no matter what. If somebody's feeling spite, it's the person in the relationship, right? And they're just putting it on to the dog. So it's not helpful. It doesn't help explain behavior. It won't help them predict their dog's behavior any better. There's just no reason to assume so without better confirmation. Question in the back. Uh, first off, thank you both for sharing your stories and your mm -hmm. thoughts on these wonderful animals. And second of all, thank you for coming out for the run. Movement is life, right? And it was great to get out and get some running. Um, I just wanted to kind of ask a little bit. Uh, I deal, I'm a veteran. I deal with veterans with you know, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. What your thoughts are both with uh, the therapy uh, that we receive from working with our animals, both the donkeys, of the burrows and the dogs. Right, so therapy dogs are now getting pretty common and, and therapy non-dogs as well. And so there is this uh, argument that E.O. Wilson put forth that, that, that Chris talks about as biophilia hypothesis that we actually are, um, it's in our genes to f ha have positive feelings on interacting with natural things, right? Being in nature, dealing with biological creatures. And in fact, now science has shown that there are specific hormonal responses that we get when you see um, a cute dog or when you pet a dog um, or a, a burrow, which is we get this rush of oxytocin, which um, everybody has, but is most commonly known as appearing when a mother gives birth and is bonding with their child. Both of them have a big rush of oxytocin, which is clearly this kind of, it's been called the love hormone, that's a little bit pat, but um, something that appears that makes you attracted toward and feel better about um, the situation you're in. So there's, there is a good scientific explanation for that happening, and it, I feel like by all means, with veterans, especially with any vulnerable population, just this contact with the natural world via these domestic animals especially because they're designed to deal with us um, is very positive and affirming. You know, one of the things that this whole experience opened my eyes to is our evolutionary history with animals. You know, we, we tend to think of like whatever we do today is kind of normal and what we've always done. And then you take a step back and realize, no, dudes, you know, humans have been around for hundreds of thousands of years. And what we're doing right now is only a tiny, like, sliver of human behavior throughout history. But when you think back to prehistory, when humans and animals first became partners, and you're living out in the wild at night, you didn't have your home security system, you didn't have your, your locks on your door, you were extraordinarily vulnerable to any predators out there. So right now, you guys have cats? Anybody have a cat? Best animal by far, right? Right. <laughs> F-dogs, sorry. But cats are the best. <laughs> <laughs> It's reverting to that kind of warfare. Um, but here's the thing about a cat. You have a cat in your arms and, and you pet it and it purrs and it's the most beautiful sound in the world, right? Look, you're, you're covering your heart with your hands. I feel the same way. But there's a reason why. Because hundreds of thousands of years ago, you had an animal in your proximity with far better auditory sense, far more acute sense of smell, 
far better night vision. And that creature has now scanned the perimeter and told you that there's no menace out there. That's a signal to you that you can now relax and close your eyes. And so your brain becomes hardwired to reaffirm that behavior. Like, this is a good thing. This partnership with this cat, it's working for us. Let's keep it going. And which is why I think today we've, we've changed the way we live, but we haven't changed our bodies. Our bodies are essentially the same as they were tens of thousands of years ago. So your body is designed to partner with animals. Yet we've decided, oh, we don't need them anymore. You know, we got Amazon Prime. We don't need to have a Jersey cow nearby. We don't need chickens. But, the, but your body doesn't know that. So that's why when you have that creature near you, your body's responding. So then the question becomes, well, what do I do, right? Do I have to have a dog? Do I have to have a donkey? You know, you can find those opportunities. There's a group in Philadelphia called the Monster Milers. These are volunteers. Do you guys know the Monster Milers? Um, I wrote a piece in the New York Times about uh, two or three weeks ago about this. Check it out. These are volunteers that take dogs, rescue dogs, out for walks and for runs. And it socializes the dogs. It gives people an opportunity to see them in action. And it gives the volunteers just the greatest karma in the world. You can actually go out and, like, murder somebody. And you get away with it if you've walked enough rescue dogs. <laughs> so, anyway, if you have those opportunities to get outside, particularly with an animal, you are actually doing your body a big favor. Yeah, I just want to say that if a cat is on your chest... <laughs> 100,000 years ago, you're probably dead. <laughs> okay, anyway. Uh, question in the back. So, um, full disclosure, I have a Border Collie. So I'm curious, are Border Collies really that smart, or are they just really, really observant? Um, border Collies are really smart at doing types of tasks. So in fact, the type of task that um, they're most famously known for recently is... Dogs like Rico and Chaser, who I'm sure you know about. Chaser is a female Porter Collie who just recently died, who had learned, uh, you know, 1,200 words. Um, and, the re and she knew, so she knew 1,200 toy names, which if you guys don't know about this, it's kind of incredible. There's so many toy names that her owner, John Pilly, who was a retired psychologist, had to write the name on them because <laughs> he couldn't remember 1,200 toy names. <laughs> but so he would go and tell Chaser to go nose this one or bring it one, and she could do it, and everybody's like, they're so smart. If you have sheep, Border Collie are super smart. But if you want a dog who will just sit and be quiet for most of the day, then actually I think they're not so smart. So it just sort of depends on what you call smart, right? Right? So dogs who look to us for, to make the next move, um, in some ways, that's anti-border collie. But it's what we're asking them to do. We're asking them to let us lead the way, less, to be able to leave them alone, to play with us. And border collies need a job, absolutely. And so they're really smart and very sensitive to us in those contexts, but not always at being companion animals. Yeah. Question in the third row. Before the question, can I just jump in? I, I get distracted. I forget stuff. So there's a guy here today that was hugely instrumental in this whole process. You finished reading Running with Sherman already, didn't you? No, I'm halfway done. Okay. Are you at the part where, where Zeke Cook shows up yet? Yes. Yep. Okay. So you know who Zeke is, right? At one point I was in an audience. I said, oh, you know who Zeke is? Who's Zeke? And the guy goes, Zeke's the man. <laughs> when you read Running with Sherman, right? Okay. Do you know he's actually here right now? Okay. Did you put, did you kiss him? <laughs> okay, okay, I guess Harrisburg. You guys are a lot more polite than other people. <laughs> if you have the opportunity, Zeke Cook is right here. This is the guy who stepped in at a crucial moment, crucial make or break moment in Sherman's training. It would not have happened without Zeke. Later on, when the rest of you guys read the book and you realize, oh my God, that dude was here and I didn't like hug him, <laughs> you're going to kick yourself. So, particularly any, also, any, any women between 20 and 25 also, <laughs> Zeke's the man. Or, or 35. I'm not, I'm not discriminatory at all. Anyway, so it's important. The Zeke Cook is right here with his awesome family, Andrea and Andy and Kelly Cook are right here. So if I were you guys, I would get, get my claws in him. And now to your question. Thank you. Um, it's probably, who's Zeke Cook? <laughs> emotions seem to evolutionarily have something to do with social cooperation. Um, whether it's correlation or causation, we're not really sure. For both authors, what are emotions to you, and is willpower slash stubbornness its own emotion, or is it conquering emotions? Okay. Um, yeah, I'm only going to go first because you said the magic word stubbornness. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think I almost feel like I want to have Zeke. Zeke, why don't you come up and answer this? 
He's also a super smart scientist, so I know when to lateral the ball. All right. Uh, can you reiterate the question? Just, <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure I, I reach the. Uh, I was, yeah, I was. I'm always curious what people think emotions are right. because I'm so bad with them. And <clears throat> also, uh, is willpower stubbornness an emotion or is it conquering emotions? So, I guess, you know, I can only speak for, for humans, but um, I would say that willpower is kind of a manifestation of kind of a stoic mindset where it's like, you know, you can only respond, uh, control how you respond to something ad adversarial to you. Now, when we talk about donkeys being stubborn, I would argue that it's in fact more of an emergent behavior that comes from generations of evolutionary selection. So it's one of those things where, you know, you can say that the donkey's being stubborn, but in fact, he's just being self-preservationist. And so the willpower there is more just, I'm doing what I can to survive, you know, and you can either roll with that or you can try to overpower it. And as I've learned several times, you can't. Uh, so yeah, donkeys are, you know, beasts, but you know, they can also be very caring. So yeah, I don't know. Sure, sure. I think that, I mean, I, th I liked what Zeke says about there being an evolutionary component to, I think that uh, emotions are things which get your body reacting to the world the way it needs to react. And most emotions are adaptive. In other words, they are the right reaction. So the feeling you have when I say, it's a lion right behind you, right? And the feeling that, that the fear or the fleeing that then ensues is an adaptive response. And so emotions are kind of the way of subverting the cognitive construction of the scene, like, huh, there's a lion. What, what do I know about lions that might be relevant in this context? What should I maybe do? And just going right to getting out of here, right? So I think there are adaptive responses to your environment. And so, you know, my feeling as an animal behavior researcher is all animals have emotions. Um, all animals have emotions. It's like a, it's, it's a neural response. And we have a subjective feeling that accompanies those emotions. I don't know that our feeling is the same as other non-human animals, right? A lot, what I feel when I th feel guilt is, is something about my own history with, well, I'm Jewish, so I had a Jewish grandmother, you know, and, um, and, and of how I learned about things that are right and wrong and how you're supposed to feel if, um, if you did something that was wrong or if you've been caught or not. Like, I, it's a memory, really. It's more, it's, instead of being uh, a neural response. So I think, does a non-human animal have those kinds of emotions? I don't know. But it would probably have more to do with their own personal history than with what's baked into the system. That's my feeling. It's what's fascinating about that question is if you ask most people like what's emotion, they'd be like, yeah, I know what emotion's obvious, but I don't think science is even really clear yet on what emotion is. I think it's fitting. Zeke, you had your hand up. Do you want to ask our final question? Uh, so I kind of had a question uh, about kind of the weird kind of pack that we, we became. So in the wild, donkeys tend to have, especially jacks, they have overlapping kind of territories where they're the dominant figure. And what was interesting to me was that flower became kind of the dominant donkey in our pack. And so my question is like, to what extent that was because of the strange set of circumstances we were under, whether it related to the fact that, you know, Sherman is not an intact male, you know, so he doesn't have that kind of uh, impulse to be the dominant burrow. I don't know. You might not be able to answer that question, uh, but yeah. Well, so I can give a sh I mean, I know nothing about donkeys, really. I mean, but, but I... But my impression is, from what I've read about um, all the donkeys' relationships, is what you had was donkeys who had just different personalities, who were put in the same context, and going to respond in different ways. So for instance, one is a little less fearful, and so will charge ahead through the water, right? And then another has some fears, or is sensitive, or has a lower threshold to um, noise, and will respond with more alacrity to noise. And so what you get when they're all in one place together is that some are leaders, and some are followers. And you also have 
um, donkeys who will be like any animal who will be very responsive to seeing someone else do it first, right? But I don't think you even have to talk about a hierarchy in the relation. I mean, they might have a hierarchical relationship, but all of that is also explained by just really, you know, animals of different personalities. We feel like it's obvious with our dogs, but it, we might not think about it with donkeys or with pigs or with farm animals, but they're all little individuals, right? So you get them together and a lot of what you're seeing is just their expression of their personality. And our minds go to, well, yeah, something else is going on, but I think it's really just them being themselves. Yeah, yeah, sure. So guys, um, Amazon did not invite me to be here today. Amazon's never invited me to be anywhere. <laughs> I'm going to sign every book today with a little stamp reproduction of Sherman's own hoof. You can order all the copies of Running Sherman you want from Amazon. You're not getting a goddamn hoof on your, on your book. <laughs> You're only getting it here at Midtown Scholar and other independent bookstores. So I know it's easier sometimes, you know, one click and the rest of it. But I mean, look at this freaking place. This is unbelievable, unbelievable treasure. <laughs> Matilda was only here because Alex insisted <laughs> that he was here. That's what you kind of get. You get a guy like Alex, you get a store like Midtown Scholar. This is this jewel, right? <laughs> so. Uh, just before we wrap up, I just want to make you guys to appreciate the kind of things you get here that you just don't get anywhere else. And it's a real thing to be treasured and supported. And thanks very much for you guys come, for coming out today. And thank you guys for doing it.